Our world is full of the unexplainable. And if history is an open book, all of these amazing tales are right there on display, just waiting for us to explore. Welcome to the Cabinet of Curiosities. A good president needs to have a lot to win. They need to be likable. They must have sound policies that benefit the American people. And, well, none of that is actually true. Politicians are a rare breed. Mix a pinch of charm, a dash of authority, and a whole heaping bowl of hubris, and you'll eventually have yourself a red-blooded American individual with grand dreams of running the country. One man had such a dream over 170 years ago when he tried running for president. His name was Dan Rice, and he made a living as an entertainer. He trained animals, he dabbled in political comedy, performed in stage shows, and parodied Shakespearean plays with his own humorous versions. Early in his career, when he had no money to his name and only one horse, larger circuses and troops made fun of his one-horse show. Although they intended to insult him, The aspiring star flipped it around and used the phrase to advertise his surprisingly enjoyable performance. As he gained in popularity, his show was able to generate more income and was eventually dubbed the greatest show on earth, years before P.T. Barnum's own traveling circus would fly that flag. Legendary American author Mark Twain admired Rice so much that his description of a circus in Adventures of Huckleberry Finn was based on the performer's famous spectacle. But Rice was best known for his enduring role as a circus clown. He didn't just run around and perform slapstick for cheering kids, though. His was more like a stand-up comedy routine than your typical clowning around. He'd perform observational humor and sing songs about the news, which let audiences in on another passion of his. Politics Rice once invited then-candidate Zachary Taylor to campaign aboard his circus wagon, encouraging the future 12th president of the United States to jump on the bandwagon, which, by the way, is how that phrase came to be. Later on, Rice decided to stop sharing the stage with other politicians and enter the fray himself. In 1864, he ran for the Pennsylvania Senate, using his immense popularity to help power his campaign. But when it later appeared that he wouldn't secure enough votes to gain traction in the polls, he dropped out. He didn't let the experience discourage him, though. Rice wanted to serve the people as best he could, and, as they say, the show must go on. When Rice tried again four years later to get elected to public office, he aimed higher this time, much higher. You see, he wanted to be the president. At first, it seemed the papers were supportive of his plans. He was a national treasure, after all, beloved by audiences everywhere. Of course, Rice had his detractors, and not everyone thought that a former circus clown had the ability to lead the people. In fact, during the campaign, a newspaper called the Somerset Democrat mocked his bid for the presidency, claiming that he had, and I quote, amassed wealth by catering to the tastes of the very lowest order of society in the disreputable capacity of a clown and showman. And that seemed to open the floodgates. More papers followed with rebukes of their own, and although he tried to respond through open letters and opinion pieces, his efforts had little effect. It didn't help that a popular military general was moving up in the polls, no doubt bolstered by his impressive performance during the Civil War. So when it became clear that he wouldn't get the nomination, Rice withdrew from the race, allowing Ulysses S. Grant to go on and become the 18th president of the United States. Dan was an entertainer, a showman, and a patriot. He loved his country and thought of no better way to show that love than to become an elected public servant. But don't think of him as a failure. He was incredibly patriotic, and those images of him with his long white beard went on to inspire a character we all know from the recruitment posters that were printed and distributed during World Wars I and II. He might not have become president, but without Dan Rice, America wouldn't have its most famous mascot of all, Uncle Sam. Typically, when someone hears a tapping noise in their house, they tend to think the worst. It could be a leaky pipe dripping inside the walls. 
or someone on the outside looking for a way in. In the case of the Irving family, it was an animal that had found its way inside. However, in 1931 on the Isle of Man, it wasn't just an animal the Irvings encountered. On one fateful September night, James, Margaret, and their daughter, Voirie, came face to face with a creature unlike anything they'd ever seen before or heard. It started with scratching and bizarre sounds emanating from the walls. The noises, which sounded like a cross between a baby's cooing and the squeaks of a rodent, caused them to investigate. And that's when they were introduced to Gef, a mongoose from India. And when I say introduced, I mean Gef introduced himself, to them, with his voice. Geff explained to the Irvings that he was a ghost that had taken the form of a mongoose. Rather than shoo him away or capture him and invite the press to photograph him, the Irvings instead invited him to stay with them. He guarded the house from intruders and hunted mice that had found their way inside. He put out the fire at night, after everyone had gone to bed, and acted like the Irvings' alarm clock, waking them up when they'd slept too late. The family rewarded Geff with food like chocolate and bananas and often brought him with them to the grocery store, although he usually stayed outside and talked to himself. Eventually, word got around about the Irvings' chatty house guest, and the papers did come knocking. Everyone wanted a glimpse of the talking animal. Some allegedly did, claiming that they even heard him speak. But not everyone was willing to believe the family's story, though. For one, Geff had never been caught on camera. There were photos of parts of the house where Geff was supposedly heard, as well as one of James Irving pointing to a set of paws coming out of the wall. Any attempts to snap a picture of the mongoose himself, though, resulted in shapeless blurs captured on film. And Geff didn't just talk. He made grandiose claims about his abilities. He said he could split the atom and read people's minds. He once told the Irvings, I could kill you all, but I won't. Geff also had a strong attachment to the family's 13-year-old daughter, Voiree. James once tried to pull her bed into their bedroom, and the mongoose screeched that he would follow her wherever they moved her. This was seen by some as evidence that Voiri herself had learned to throw her voice, making it sound as though it was coming from some small animal in the room, when it wasn't. Naturally, people wanted proof. There were plenty of stories, for sure, but very little in the way of actual evidence. The Irvings allowed photos of footprints and stains on the walls to be taken. They also provided a fur sample for study. Once everything was analyzed, though, it was clear what the Irvings really had on their hands. A sheepdog. Not a talking sheepdog, just a regular barking sheepdog. Their own, named Mona. The fur, the stains, and the footprints all belonged to her. And the blurry photos they claimed were of Geff? Those were of Mona, too, just on the move. And after James died in 1945, Margaret and Voiree sold the house claiming they left Geff the mongoose behind. Vari claimed until the day she died in 2005 that Geff had been real. She hadn't made him up, nor had she performed ventriloquism to fool everyone into thinking they lived with a talking mongoose. In the years following their departure from the house, though, psychic investigators and ghost hunters stayed there for extended periods, hoping to hear from the elusive mongoose. What they discovered, though, were possible explanations for Geff's tiny, chatty voice. As it turned out, the walls of the house had been built with significant airspace between the wood on the inside and the stone on the outside. That gap basically turned the walls into great big amplifiers, able to carry voices all over the house without anyone having to shout. As for Geff himself, few actually believed a talking mongoose had lived with the Irvings, A member of the International Institute for Psychical Research theorized that Geff was nothing more than a creation of James Irving, a kind of split personality he created to help him deal with the stresses of daily life. But that's all it was, just a theory. Even though much of the physical evidence points to the Irving's dog rather than a talking mongoose, the fact is that no one knows who Geff was or where he came from. Was he a ghost that had taken the form of a small, weasel-like creature? Or was he a figment of James Irving's imagination? Whether we discover the truth or not, there's no denying that the possibilities are very curious. I hope you've enjoyed today's guided tour of the Cabinet of Curiosities. 
Subscribe for free on Apple Podcasts or learn more about the show by visiting curiositiespodcast.com. This show was created by me, Aaron Mankey, in partnership with How Stuff Works. I make another award-winning show called Lore, which is a podcast, book series, and television show. And you can learn all about it over at theworldoflore.com. And until next time, stay curious. Stay curious.